Steve, you wanna you wanna take the hose and wash off this log here? Yeah. Just, just what I'm doing here, we're washing off this log because the bark is full of grit. It'll have sand and gravel and every other nice thing that's really good to dull uh, your saw. Dull my saw. I used to drive down to Brookings and I'd buy a log of myrtle wood and then I'd drive over to Grant's Pass where my dad lives. We'd spend the next day cutting it up. We had two saws. We used one saw for cross cut and we used one cross one saw for ripping and we pressure washed. We actually got that's good, Steve. That's really good. We then got the pressure washer out and we pressure washed the logs. You really that's I, I encourage you to have water available. You'll see why when I do the end cuts, why the water's really good. It helps you read the grain. And I'm just going to start by doing some basic drawings of, of what to look for. So one of the things is I look at this and all I see is wood bowls, right? But some of you guys do hollow forms, some of you do platters. My friend Masamichi Natani does carvings. So Mas and I would look at this same piece of wood. I see bowls, he sees bears, you know, Roger might see hollow forms, you know, Mike Mahoney would see nothing but platters. You know, so you're looking at the same piece of wood. So really the first thing is, what do you want out of it? I'm a bowl turner, so most of this demo will be about bowls, maybe platters. It'll depend how deep the feather is in this crotch. We're going to cut up this crotch. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to start just by a couple of drawings. So myrtle wood rarely grows round. Myrtle wood's a little bit unusual. But say we got round here, all right? Most of my bowls in my shop come out this way, out of the shop. And if you look at it, how the grain rope is in the tree, you can tell what the pattern is going to be. So the grain in this one is like this, all right? You can also do a flat sawn bowl this way. So if you're doing natural edge, you can do that, you can cut it off or leave it natural edge. And if you look at it, the grain is running this way. Okay. Our next next one is quarter saw. Here, you have a bowl coming out of here, or your platter. This is Mike Mahoney's, does all his platters quarter sawn. If you look here, all the grain is running this way. So when you go in, when you go into the hardware or into like Gilmer's or a Woodcraft or any of those places that have bowl blanks, this one up here, here's what it's going to look like when you finish this bowl. It's going to be a little oval or round here as you're looking down into the bowl, all right? That's this one right here. This one right here, I call it the butterfly pattern. because the grain's in it differently. And you can actually have a couple of different patterns, but this is the main one. Quarter sawn one, you're going to look down in it, and it's going to be like this. So when you look at the end of the block of wood you're thinking about buying, or you know, hear from the club, or Gilmer's, or wherever, if you see it like this, you know that when you get done, you're going to have a bowl that has straight lines in the bottom of it. Here, you know you're going to end up with this butterfly pattern. And if you, I call this the upside down bowl or natural edge, you're going to end up with a round or an oval in the bottom of your bowl. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, any questions on That's the basic three bowls. Mike Mahoney, all of Mike Mahoney's platters are quarter sawn. If you buy a, a roughed out platter from Mike, they're, they're all quarter sawn. Much more stable. And then he would take another one, smaller one here, and then, depending how big it is. All of his, so he wastes a lot of wood, but his blanks are much more stable. So that's Mike Mahoney. What's a rift cup look like? Okay, so good. This, this, here's another one. What you want to avoid, and I'll try to avoid today. Say you've got a really big log, all right? And say it's 30 inches across. 
me, Dale, I'd take one nice balanced bowl out of it, all right? That's what I'd do. It'd be really nice to be balanced and have a real pretty pattern in there. The guy that's cutting up this log, he just wants to sell a lot of bowl blanks to wood turners. So he's going to cut it up this way. He's going to take a bowl this way and a bowl this way. The problem here with these bowls is the grain is running like this. And it won't give you a very pretty pattern in the bottom of your bowl. And it's going to warp, uh, not warp uniform. Like if you take... take this bowl and you rough it out, the old center is going to be the new center. It's going to warp evenly. It's going to warp a little bit high in the center down here. This one here is going to warp kitty wampus. It's not going to be very pretty. The pattern inside your bowl is not going to be pretty. So for me, the title of the class that I get, one of the classes I give, is how to get the best bowls out of the tree. It's not how to get the most bowls out of the tree. So the ones that you just drew, those are the ones you use yeah. acrylic paints on. No, I don't use paints. <laughs> well, <laughs> so what you can do you wait here, until it stabilizes and then have to return it. <laughs> say you got a 30-inch log here, all right? You want a 16-inch bowl, which is quite large, actually. Yeah, very few we'll people, very few people have room for a 16-inch bowl. But say you took a 16-inch bowl out of here. What you can do is take spindle pieces out of here. Okay, you don't waste the wood, this can be spindle wood. Yep. You take the best bowl and turn the rest of the log into spindle wood. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, one And that spindle wood is quarter sawn. It's, it's both quarter and flat sawn. Yeah, I was going to say, depending, the depending, on, depending on where you, where you do, what, you, what orientation you look at. It. So here's what you see in myrtle wood a lot. This is oval. I've tried to draw this a little bit oval. And there's the pith. All right. That's real, real common in, in myrtle wood. Almost very few of them grow round. And so if you want the biggest bowl, you would be tempted to take this bowl right here. That bowl is really going to warp. It's not going to be balanced. It's just not very pretty. Really, the answer is when you get a log like this, and we'll take a look at these as we cut, the right answer is to take a bowl like this, maybe take a second bowl like this. These bowls will be balanced. They're a little bit smaller, but they'll be prettier. So, anyway, so what we're going to do here now is I'm going to trim both ends off till we get down to good wood, all right? So, one of the penalties you get when you ask me to cut up your wood is I turn a lot of it into firewood. And, because um, we're not going to have any cracks in these blocks of wood when I get done with them. Oh, one other, so, Let's do one, let me do one more drawing because you're not all bowl turners. The other thing you're going to see in a lot of logs, here's your pith. They almost always have a center crack, almost always, and it depends on which ones they are. But sometimes if you get really unlucky, you get center cracks like this. Okay, what are you going to do? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to take a bowl over here. You're going to take a hollow form here and a hollow form here. I mean, you, you got no choices. You can't, you know, you, you can put all the super glue and God's green earth in that crack. It's still, the crack's still there. And again, I don't turn wood with cracks in it. There's a, God caused, charges high to it to turn wood with cracks. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do, this was cut fairly recently, this face here. This face here was cut a while back, uh, and they're, they both have got checks in them. So I'm just going to I'm going to trim off both ends just so we can see fresh wood and uh, see what we got. And I don't have your muffs for 14 people, so plug your ears. <laughs> and your most expensive tool in the shop should be your lathe, not your hearing aid. Yeah, right. <laughs>
meant to start with a safety talk about chainsaws. Um, first of all, when I'm cutting a piece of wood, nobody touches the piece of wood I'm cutting on. If it starts to move, we just let it move, right? People want to reach out and grab it with their hands. It's a good way to get caught. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, the other thing is, when I'm chainsawing, nobody can be close enough that if I swing the chainsaw, they get hit. Fair enough? And then the other thing is, when I'm chainsawing, I'm interested. People in the firing line, if you'd step out of the way, because this can throw, say I hit a rock or something, you know, it could throw up Sounds the brutal. And the really dangerous thing with chainsaws is kickbacks. <clears throat> if you engage this upper corner of your saw into wood, like say I had another piece of wood right next to this and I'm going down and I come back up and I catch this upper corner on that other piece of wood, it's going to kick back. You cannot control it. I don't care if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. You cannot control that kickback. And so uh, be really careful that the end of your bar is clear. I, I don't like using uh, chainsaws that are too short for the block of wood. I brought my, I didn't know how big this wood was. I think I got a 36 inch bar on that one. I want to cut all the way through the block of wood when I cut. So. Um, all right. So we got got some firewood here. So cookies. <laughs> uh, hand me the hose there. Yeah. Man, it's nice having a doctor as your room assistant. <laughs> Found something that qualifies for it. Did you see the difference? See what happened when I put water on there? You can see the whole grain pattern. It, it really lets you see the grain pattern. So here's your heartwood. Here's your sapwood where the spalting has already moved into it. Fungus has already moved into this wood. And so, uh, but the water lets you read the wood really much better. So, um, okay. question. Go for it. On the other side, it looks like there's two pits. Yeah, yeah, is this a crotch? I mean, there's, there's limbs here. There's a limb here. Okay. There's. I think I think I think that was a limb that was just yeah. just past the cut. Yeah, okay. Yeah. See, here was another limb that came off. This was a limb at one point. Um, That's a limb as opposed to a hook. Yeah. It's not. When you're trying to get rid of the cracks on the end, and you're investigating where they end, how much do you take off each cut until you find it? I mean, that one of those. Well, you take it off till you get down to this good wood here. Just an inch of so you can see the difference. This is why I put water on it. See how much? You can't read this grain really. So I don't see any. So looking on the scrap piece, I don't see any radial checks. See, we got. Oh, well, that's some pith mark there, but there's some radial checks there. That, oh, that's some pith marks there. All right, you can see here, here's one of the piths here, and you can see these radial checks coming out from the pith, right? If you flip this over, you can see there's no, there's no checks. And that's what I'm looking for, is no checks on the scrap. And I don't know if we can do this or not, I don't know how strong this is. That's why you want to get rid of the cracks. There's no strength there. So... <coughs> All right, so we're going to assume this is this is healed over. I'm guessing there's a limb here. I'm guessing this is down on the tree. Yeah, this has got to be down. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know what that's going to do. But you can look here. So this is really, th these are um, water-soluble ink pencils. They write on wet wood. They're really nice to have. So you can see here. Here's the center crack on this one. So the first thing I do is I mark the center crack. And it kind of looks like there's maybe some cracking this way, but I can't really tell. It just, it's kind of like it's indicating it might want to crack. But let's assume that this is solid from this point. I take my ruler and I actually start until I get the best balance. So if I there's there's your biggest bowl, right? But look how lop, lopsided it is. You don't really want that. 
So I get this like this. Here's this is the top of my bowl. I actually have to stand over here, and I I do this until I get a nice balanced pattern here as best I can. I think that's that's pretty good. So we're gonna we're gonna say that's there. There's my. I always change saw the bottom flat so that it's safe on the on the uh, bandsaw. You never want a bandsaw on around. You know. You know. All right. So there's and the other rule is best bowl first. There's our best bowl. All right. Second best bowl. And that one's pretty balanced. It's not as deep, but it's pretty balanced. And we'll leave a little bit more sapwood on this since it's a little bit smaller. And that here, looks like a spindle blank. <laughs> here we have a Sahalo form. Okay. So, so now let's. Now you have some artistic decisions to make. All right. So I like actually having the whole log because then I can cut it up as I go. What's going to happen here is we're going to have one good section and then we're going to have a, a shorter section which will either end up small bowls or hollow forms or something. But it's, the, I, I know we had a loading issue, we had to load this into a vehicle so. Um, Alright, so here's the question, how wide, you know, if you want just heartwood, there's how long you need to cut it. You want to leave a little bit of sapwood, which I would in this case. I think that's a, some of the prettiest uh, area. But this is, you can see this is gray dirty. Yeah. It's not, this, I can tell you when this is dry that won't be pretty. Okay. But that's life. I guess that's it's not pretty. Life. But let's say, it changes from brown to gray. let's say we got 13 inches here, all right? Yeah. So I'm going to cut this 14 inches long. I'm going to give myself an extra inch in case my chainsaw doesn't cut straight or something, okay? So we're going to put this down, I'm going to cut it 14 inches long, and then we'll do the, uh, the rip cuts. So the chain that I'm using on my chainsaw is a rip blade. It's got half the teeth of a cross cut. And, uh, if you use a cross cut saw in the rip direction, you'll end up get, taking too much wood out and you'll jam up your saw. So, uh, 14 inches. That used to be the max I can use on my 16 inch there blade there. Deal. So, yep, so. So keep it up. <laughs> so there's eight inches. So we got, we'll end up with some probably hollow forms or small bowls on this. I was gonna say eight inches about what the middies will take. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, again, you know, I look at this and all I see is bowls, mm -hmm. but, you know, hollow forms. I also do a lot of spheres, so what I would do in this case, I'd cut this here. This will all get bandsawed into rounds, which will all ultimately be spheres. That's the way I would, I would use it, but it's also little hollow forms. It's just a chunk of wood. Got some interesting things going on. And it is a crotch. You can see the teeth. So you can see the advantage of having water here. So I would just take my calipers here on this and here. And I won't do it. You can take this into the bandsaw, but you just draw your cir whatever circles you want here. So you got a pith here, you got rotten wood here. Got another pith over here. I'd take a round here, probably take a round here. Right here is your prettiest one. There's your feather pattern. I'd probably take a round right out of this feather. That would make a really, really pretty hollow form or a sphere. So my first one would be right in there. All right. Do hollow form things um, have the grain like a spindle turning? Yeah, Okay. most of them. You can also turn 
John Jordan does a lot of them this way. You can also turn them flat grain. He likes putting the sapwood up around the top of his pieces. So you can turn them either, most, but most hollow forms are end grain this way. So I would, I would take, there's the prettiest piece of wood there. I'd take that first. All right, so now, all right, so I got some scraps here. So when I chainsaw, I like to have my line straight up and down. So we're going to cut our best bowl blank first. Again, take the best wood out first. So I'm going to get that line straight up and down. Do you do the do the foot first before you do the? No, I'll do work? the center cut first. Okay. So we're going to look over here. Ah, okay. So we got a pith right here and a pith here. I'm not, I can't turn this around. So that pith looks solid. So there there must there must be a limb coming down into the tree this way. We're going to have to live with that right there. That's life. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to cut right to about there. I'm going to be sawing this way. down on the tree, up in the tree. This limb got cut off or broke somewhere in here. The water came down, rotted this section right here. That's the way life is. I tell people I don't grow the tree, I just turn the tree. <laughs> when you're planting your blanks, does it matter which direction the tree grew, up or down? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. <clears throat> All right. So now we have us a blank. We have us. There's our sawn blank, all right? And in this one, the pith is pretty close to the center, which is actually going to be nice for us. So there's the pith. But that's not really the critical thing here. The critical thing here, if you want a nice balanced pattern, you want a bowl like this with a nice balanced pattern in it. The critical thing is the low point of the heartwood. So I'm going to draw, let's say that's the heartwood sapwood line, all right? Where this pith is is pretty irrelevant. Where the bottom of the growth ring is between the heartwood and the sapwood, that's going to be the center of my bowl. That'll get you your best pattern. If you <clears throat> say your pith is over here and you center your bowl on this, I'm going to tell you it's going to grow like that. The bottom of the heart wood is over here. If you make this the center of your bowl, it's not going to be balanced in the bottom. It's going to be like slash sawn. So for me, what I'm going to do now is look for where's the bottom of the growth ring. That'll be the center of my bowl. So. Let's just, again, water is really nice. Let's just kind of see things. So, I'm going to tip this up on end. If you've got, you guys can kind of come over. See, this is pretty nice here. I'm going to actually hose this in down. All right, there, great. All right, so if you come over and see, here's the bottom of the growth ring, right? 
That's the set. So that's going to be the center of my bowl. Now the pith is here, so they're pretty close in this one. But I can tell you in Myrtlewood, that's not Unusual. that's not the <laughs> the usual. So the center of my bowl is going to be there. So I, I actually have to turn this around. I'm, so I'm going to come up here. I'm going to mark this end here. Let's take a look at this end. And I have to again. I have, I have to be ordered. So the center is right about here. So I'm going to mark this right here. And I'm just going to eyeball it. That's going to be the center of my bowl. Okay, from the center on that end to the center on this end. I'm going to look. This limb here is solid. We have to live with this knot. This knot goes down there. There's another one here. Hmm. Can I ask you a question? Go Bill? for it. When you say you have to live with it, I love knots. I love character and I love all that stuff. And my dad wood. did too. My dad liked the ones with bark inclusions and holes and everything. I turn uh, functional gallery bowls. The problem with piss is they yeah. like to crack. Uh -huh. And you can dry this. <clears throat> so we're going to rough this out today. Say we rough this bowl out today. Uh -huh. Next summer it'll be dry, all right? Say it a year, roughly, for Myrtlewood. And you, it's down to, in, in Dave's shop here or in my shop that are unheated, it'll dry down to about 12-13% in a year. I have a drying room off to the side that's kept at 70 degrees year round, goes in there, it'll dry down to about 7%, which if you go into your house and you check the moisture in your house, the drawers and all the other wood in your house, it'll be around 7% in this area. The problem is, this, this bowl gets bought and it's sent as a wedding gift down to Arizona because this is Oregon wood. And it goes down to Arizona and it goes, I have to dry a whole bunch more and that knot's going to crack. I guarantee it, it's going to crack. If it goes to Hawaii, it's going to gain moisture, so you're probably okay. But the, the problem is when, when this wood wants to live somewhere, and this wood wants to live in western Oregon, if you send it to Arizona, that's going to crack. I just damn near guarantee it. <coughs> so that's one reason I don't like knots. They can add a lot of figure, so the upside is they add figure, they add interest and all that. So if you're doing an artistic bowl, knots and voids and all mm. that's great. If you're doing functional bowls, maybe not so much. So if it comes out of a kiln, how dry will it be? Well, can't we just run it through a kiln then? Well, you can, but every wood has a different drying schedule. Yeah. If you dry it too fast, you honeycomb the wood. So I don't know if you've ever bought lumber from a store and you get home and it's, it's got honeycombs on the end grain, that wood got dried too quick. And so uh, you can, like, get Phil Lapp. Phil's in your group, too. He's in our group. He's got it. He's taken an old refrigerator and taken everything out of the inside, put a bulb down in the bottom and put holes in the top, holes in the bottom. And he, he coats them. He would rough this out. He'd coat it with some kind of sealer. I forget what sealer. Anchor sealer. No, it's not anchor seal. It's like a shellac or something. Yeah. And he puts it in there, and three weeks later, it's dry. The upside is you get your bowl dried a lot quicker. The downside is the faster you dry the wood, the more brittle it will be. And Alan Batty from England talked about this. If you... Air-dried wood is the nicest wood to turn. If you, the faster you rough it out, if you run it into a kiln, it's going to be more brittle. It's not going to be as nice to turn. You get it quicker. So the commercial guys all have kilns. Glenn Lucas has a big refrigerator box that he's converted into a big kiln. And, you know, that's he just has to do that because he gets orders for 500 bowls. Well, you know, he can't afford to wait for a year for 500 bowls to dry. So uh, the, the fastest way to dry this, and we had the guy from down here in Winlock or something talked about alcohol. You can, you can take denatured alcohol, rough this out, put the denatured alcohol for about three days. The alcohol goes in there, it replaces the water. You take it out, the alcohol evaporates, and you got dry wood in a week or less. But it's really brittle. So um, it's really what? I'm sorry. Brittle. What's brittle. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's really brittle. And it would take a lot of. Take I was going to say that's a that's a few a lot, gallons of alcohol. It's a lot of alcohol. <laughs> All right, so I, I take, these are my grandpa's cal calipers from North Dakota. 
and I just sit here and first I'd see what's optimistic, what's our biggest bowl of course. We always want the biggest bowl. And so the things you have to look for here now, okay here's the heartwood sapwood line here. Here's a heartwood sapwood line here. So we got about an inch of sapwood on each side. That's that's one balance. So So there's my optimistic bowl. And we'll put the, we will take this over to the bandsaw. Take that over to the bandsaw, mark my center point here. Bandsaw that round. That's ready to go on the lathe to be roughed out. Where do you get your pencil? You can get these at any art store. This this I got online from Dewert, D-E-R-W-E-N-T. But it's just a water-soluble pencil, water-soluble ink pencil. All the art stores, Michaels has them. So they're just really nice for writing on wet wood. All right, so there's our first plan. Let's we'll just make a pile of this. Okay, here's our second valuable piece. Now on this one, you can see there's a flaw on this end. This end is nice and clean. Here's the center of our bowl on this end. A little bit harder to read on that end. But I want to get, I don't, I don't want this big rotten bark pocket. We're gonna, we're gonna see what happens. Here, let's let's start. We got less heartwood here, so let's let's do a smaller bowl just for fun. I want to see if I can get rid of that rotten spot. Looks to me like the rotten spot goes right through the pith here. It could no. it could do that. That's, that may be like an old branch that... It's a branch that broke off and the bark inclusion went down through it. And so I'm just going to trim this end off just to see if we got rid of that. I, I don't know if we did or not, but... You need your saws over here. I need the ears. I need my ears. Thank you. And you can see how the chips come out long ripping them. Uh, Glenn Lucas has a bigger exhaust here on his saw. He's got bigger saws, and so he doesn't get this jam up that I get. So, so you have two saws. You were talking about two different kinds of chains to avoid the buildup, or no? This is the rip. This is the rip blade. So you can see it's only got half the teeth of a crosscut blade. So and you just use the rip. I just rip use it all. It works both ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a little rougher on the crosscut. A little rougher on the crosscut? Not really. Not, Not really. really? Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's gonna go all the way to that center point. So we didn't get rid of it. But but this is on the bottom of the bowl. This will be the top of the bowl up here. Most of that might go away when we curve the bowl. This is going to be a fairly shallow bowl, so. All right, so here's, this is the hollow form piece we had. So we're just going to. I'm just going to snip it here and snip it here. You can see it's really nice to have a cutting bench. I actually saw about 12, 14 years ago in AEW in the tip section, they had they had this bench section here, and uh, the guy had metal all rod for the uprights. I thought, you know, I might hit those. So I put wood uprights in. This here, if you know, these, I mean, these blocks of wood are three, four, five hundred pounds. If it's smaller logs, I can just roll them right up on the bench. So that's what the ramp is for. So here we just have a really nice hollow form piece of wood. A little bit of flaw here, but most of that will go away.
bigger logs, he has a tractor with a lift on. Yeah, I have a tractor. <laughs> I was <gonna> say. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the next piece we're going to cut up is that piece right there. Let's. This is this is a nice piece of wood. I'll let somebody else. They can. You got some little uh, calipers to draw circles and yeah. saw that round. Yeah. Let's. Uh, let's just put five degrees. So I've roughed it out, and it's now in bags with dry chips. And I, I keep changing the chips. I'm on my third set of chips because this wood's really, really nice, and uh, the feather grows from the pith up to the crotch. So the feather is right here. Now you can down here limb go, that can be fiddle back, so that can be pretty. But the feather itself is right here. Now I'm going to take this log and I'm going to turn it 90 degrees, all right? So here's our crotch. Here's our pith. The feather is right between this line and that line, from here up to the crotch. And the feather is strongest near the pith. The further you get away from the pith, the less feather you have. So on a regular bowl, here's our tree. Most of our bowls would be taken out of the tree this way, right? That's just what we cut now. Most of our bowls come out this way. No, I'm oh, there we right. I'm backwards. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Dale's backwards. Dale, Dale's, Dale's fine. Dale's just doing live edge today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we are. So most of our bowls are taken out of the tree this way. The, one we, the two we just cut are taken out of the tree this way. But up here, you don't want to do that because if you t turn your bowl like that, you turn out all the feather. You get rid of all the pretty wood. So here, we want to take the bowl this way because when you look in the bowl, you want to see that feather pattern in the bottom of the bowl. So again, the bowl is right here. I mean, the perfect bowl is right there with the feather in your bowl. And you, you put the bottom of the bowl right near the pith line. So that's what we're going to try and do on this one, alright? I don't guarantee that will happen, but we're going to try. Now, so you can see on the crotch that he's drawn that the wood above the crotch is all straight grain wood, right? And, and, and so cutting a crotch like this, this is not really cut the way you'd want to cut it if you were cutting it. He would cut it off here and then he would extend down here and have the crotch right here. So this has had a lot of the bottom of the crotch cut out. Yeah, I would have, I would have made this cut maybe six inches lower because I have to take, you can see this is really end checked. I've got to take about two inches off of here and then I'll cut this back up here and I'm going to cut this off. You can see this is all end checked. So we've lost part of the feather. That's life. <laughs> but when you're cutting your own, don't crotch and then take below the crotch. Yeah, and, and I always cut long. Yeah, we're going to make this cut right here. Oh, and I would have wow. cut long here because if you waste a little bit of wood here, that's okay, but you don't want to cut off any of the feather. So, so when you take a, a tree, a hundred foot tree, you don't just measure off two foot pieces. You go through and customize I cut it, each I cut, it, I cut one at a time. Yeah. Okay. I, I would cut, I'd cut one and the rule is most valuable first. So um, I would start down at the stump at the base and work my way up. Yeah. If it's got a nice crotch, it's first. If it's got a nice burl, that's first. Most valuable first. Then you work your way up, you get up into the limbs, that wood is less valuable. But that way if your chainsaw dies, you run out of gas, you run out of energy, you have the best wood on the pickup. So. I would start with the best wood first. That's that's the rule. Can you put on your drawing where you would cut that tree up? Yep, true. Thanks. So it's, in terms of the limbs that are less valuable, it's up to the knees though that you would get some uh, hollow form or boxes. Depends on how big it is. Yeah. So the question is where would I cut this up? And I would cut it down. I would want to cut it down below wherever I figured the fifth the uh, pith was. So you can kind of look at this and you can see this grew pretty steep. And once I cut this end off, I'll be able to connect those two points. So uh, some of, if it's wider, then it's a shallower feather. 
Um, you know, typically, that's probably the best compromise if the limbs are like that. If I have a slideshow that I teach on how to cut it out, and we had a five-way crotch. Big, it was a big, massive black walnut crotch. And uh, Howard and I, we cut it up. And I've got a slideshow on your clubs to see it sometimes. And it showed the sequence of how to cut it up. You look at how it grow. You cut the first crotch and you cut the second crotch. This one's pretty simple. This is pretty simple. So my first cut would be down here below where I know the feather is. So I don't care if I waste a little bit of wood here. It's straight grain. And then I would cut it like this. And I would cut it like that. And I always chainsaw from the upper side. The most feather is here. The further down you go, there's less feather. So I always chainsaw from the upside because that's where the most valuable feather is. So the first thing we're going to do is trim the ends of this and, and the, the limb off, and then we're going to take a look at it. I, 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 so the way this thing is cut now, the actual... Yeah, it's, it's sitting okay. It's okay. It's sitting okay. okay. I, I'm okay where it's at. The way it is now where the two pits enter is actually it was cut up in this area. <laughs> It was, no, this came from down Reed's Fort South. I don't know exactly where. No, no, no. Uh, this was cut more like this? Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. Cut, it was cut too cut close. Too to up high. It okay. was cut too high, yeah. I didn't make that cut. Where, where'd the tree <laughs> come from? Coke Hill. There you go, Reed's Fort South. Now you see why he prefers to cut vertical because you can't maintain a flat surface when you're cutting horizontal. It always dishes a little Bill, bit. If you were picking a myrtle tree, I always say I want the gnarliest tree you got. But it sounds like you want the cleanest Hello. tree. I want the cleanest tree. With that said, I want crotches, I want burls, I want figured wood. You know, if you're going to do utilitarian bowls, Knots and bark inclusions are not your friend. Gas! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So Dale, how often do you tighten up your chain? When it needs to be tightened. <laughs> I mean, is it loose now? or? Okay, tell? good question on chainsaw safety. How often do you tighten my chain? Uh, the guy from Steel Chainsaw said if you can pull the teeth out of the groove, you need to tighten it a little bit. This one's okay. okay. But this is also about a half used blade. If you get a new blade, put it on, tighten it, and you chainsaw for 10 minutes, you've got to stop because the new chain is going to stretch and then you've got to tighten it again. What you don't want it to do is come out of the groove and flip off the... That's a good question. So, so now Steve's going to hose this end off for me and hose this, not this end here off. Alright, so this is the upper side of this. Oh yeah, you can see that. You can see that. This is the upper side. So then we're going to turn it over after we draw this one. But, all right, so here's not too bad for a center crack. Got good solid wood here. That's good. So we're sitting pretty good. You can see the spalting. Again, Sarah Robinson could tell you which fungus did that. But some fungus. All right, on this fungus end. Fungus. You don't like spalting? Depends. 
Huh? Depends. Can be pretty in maple if it's not too far gone. In madrone, it's really ugly. It's brown, dull. It takes the luster out of the wood. The problem with spalting, it takes the luster out of the wood. This wood here is all live, right? Yeah. It'll, it'll really nice and shiny. This will be dull. It, it just takes it takes the luster out of the wood. It can be pretty, and if you get Mike and he or uh, uh, Dave Dave Williams takes that crappy wood like you got over here down to Wilsonville and they yeah. stick all that colored plastic in it. That's really nice. You know, you wouldn't want this wood. This this wood wouldn't absorb that uh, plastic. That that stuff over there is perfect for it. You could take that fiddle back block down there, have it infused with red, green, purple, whatever color you want, and it's be stunning. The wood would be absolutely stunning. All right, so we got a pith here. Our pith to the knot is there, so I'm going to draw a straight line between these two piths. There's our straight line. Again, the, the feather is going to be between here and here, right? And it's going to be, the feather is going to be here. So one of the things that we might do here is, since we're going to take our bowl out of here, we could take a flat sawn bowl off here. Look at this. So we got, instead of just sawing that in two, I could saw that in two and I'd have two spindle pieces. Or I could saw this off first and I'd get a nice bowl blank out of it, which is what I would do. Because this is straight grain here, right? Our bowl, the bowl that we want is going to be, in, our two bowls are going to be like this. I mean, theoretically, that's where our bowls are going to be. So we can, we're going to get three bowls out of this. I'll turn this up. We'll cut this off, and then I'm going to chainsaw down that. So now we're going to, I'm going to show you the other end. So let's see what the other end looks like. All right. There's still a lot of cracking there. There's still a lot of crack. All right. So I'm going to get this end going straight up and down. I'm going to look straight over here. Here's our main pith right there. I'm going to mark it right here, right there. So I want to connect all three pits. The, the goal here will be to connect all three pits. Yes, not officially, but yes. So the top center pit, the bottom center pit, and the branch pit. Because this pit here, it goes down, and it looks like probably connects. It could be this one, or that could be this limb. I don't know. Or the pith is already connected down there. I just don't know that answer. If it was a if it was a very horizontal branch, it might very well already connect. Yeah, I, I'm guessing. I think I think this pith here is this one. I think that's this one, but I don't know. All right, so we're gonna I'm gonna actually roll this over because again, let's take look at that. Though, see, look at that crack there. There's the bowl blank on the bottom. Well, I mean, we just. Again, I didn't grow this tree, so but we're going to we're going to we're going to be optimistic here. We're going to be optimistic and take off the bowl blank on the bottom. Gonna... There's another piece right there you can use. That's pretty good. Stuff. You're not under. It's it's good. All right, so there's, I'm, I'm cutting straight up from this pith here, right? There's my line. And what we'll probably end up doing is taking off another inch or two off this end of the bowl. See if we can get rid of that crack.
take a look at this bull blank. So we got a good solid end on this end. This is the end with the crack. Again, here's the bottom of my growth rings. Right there. Bottom of the growth rings. Walnut's really nice because you can see it. A lot of times in maple it's hard to see. Cherry's easy to see. So there's going to be the center. This is the end we want to get rid of. So again, so if you look at this again now, heartwood sapwood line here, heartwood sapwood line here. So So now the question really is how you know how much sapwood do you want to leave on it? I'm actually going to balance the sapwood here a little bit. We're going to be a little bit more optimistic. <clears throat> we're going to cut. We're going to cut that much off this end and see if that gets it. Mark the center so I can find it on the lathe. I'm going to nip this end off. I want to see if I got rid of that crack. a little bit. Even though I'm in rip, I'm cutting down through end grain through the crotch, so I'm getting different chips. So, Well, let's see how we did. Not bad. All right, not bad actually. Yeah. All right. So you can see the the feather went down to the other. So you can see here's the upper part of the crotch. Here's going down the tree. So it was cut. It would have been better if we had cut this. A little bit further down the tree. But, yeah, all right, so. But yeah, you got some pretty feather right there. Yeah, so, Especially yeah, this oh, one. this is stunning. This is stunning. No bark inclusions, uh, no bark inclusions whatsoever. Nice feather. I mean, these, these are very, very nice planks. So now, and I wanted to. I wanted to see this face before I made decisions. So you, you could take a platter out of this. Your limiting factor is how thick is it right here. So this wood, even though there's feather up here, I mean you could do a platter out of this. So it's Don's wood, right? If you want a platter, we can take a platter off of here and we'll end up with about a 14, 15 inch platter. That's one option. If we want a bowl, the bowl's got to be smaller because there's no wood right right here in the crotch. So, do you want a platter or you want a bowl, Don? Well, what's your recommendation, Dale? Well, I, mean, I, turn, hell, I, turn, I... I turn bowls, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's his answer. You, you get a big platter or a small bowl? Well, Dave that, yeah, Wood is, at? It's about a 11, 12 inch bowl, so... It's, so Dave, 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 give I'm him sorry. a platter and a what bowl. What do we want? Well, let's see. Dave, what... Dave turns platters here. Well, I don't, what I don't know... I don't know how thick, what I don't know here is how far down does this feather go this way. I don't know that answer. I was going to say, reading the wood on this side, it doesn't. It looks like it goes down maybe about Well, the feather on this end, on the bottom end, is very shallow. Okay. The feather up here is thicker on this end. Okay. I think we should, we should do both, Dale. We want to platter the edge and then take a bowl out of the bottom piece. 
Well, you can do that too. That's it's, what I want. All right. So, so we want to. Yes. We're going to do a platter. We're going to take about a two-inch slab off the top of this. Yeah. And but you just, didn't you'll give have me that a, option. You then you'll have a small, bold, flat grain, full blank on the bottom. Okay. That's what we want. All right. We don't. All right. So, so if you're turning that guy, platter, <clears throat> how do you know which side up so you don't waste your feather? Well, we'll 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 make that decision after we make this cut down here. We see how deep this feather goes. So if it's we could this most likely this on a platter. The problem we've got we've got a crack here. Uh oh. A little bit, but it doesn't go too deep. But no, I, that, you can't even feel that. Yeah, but it, there's it, it crack. It, trust me, it's there. It's there. It's there. <laughs> I can't even feel a bit. Trust me, I'm a cop. <laughs> <laughs> Would I lie to you? <laughs> Government, is that what he is, a comp? Is that what the issue is here? Is. <laughs> Alright, so what I'm doing here, I like to have my cal when I'm doing feathers, yeah. I like to be able to kind of imagine. I think a, I think a platter would showcase that feather. Oh, it's, it's, Dale. Yeah, it definitely will. I, I really want a feather so I can explain it to people because I've made up stories about feathers before. <laughs> I don't know if I got it any better or not, but it's a little closer. Well, right. So there's that one. And we're gonna make okay. it, we're we're gonna cut that one two inches thick. You wanna do a bowl on this one just so we got a, a difference yeah, here? That's a good plan. I think we want a bowl on that one. That one doesn't look quite as throw interesting. Me a, can you throw me one of those two bys, Steve? Yeah. What's your opinion, Dale? I, I'd make a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, don't ask him. He's going to make a bowl out of anything. Yeah. He's going to turn that way. <laughs> All right, but again, again, I'm feeling with my hand, and the shallow part of this crotch is kind of like about like this, all right, on the feeling down here. That's always your limiting factor. Now, on maple or a nice, say, a nice balanced crotch, you could leave that natural edge. You just leave, you know, and I do that quite a bit with crotch. Gives you a little bit more height. I'm not going to do that here because this piece is not balanced. I'm a little unbalanced myself. So, <laughs> so it's, you know, who is it? It's only fitting. All right, so. I like having the feather go right down the middle of the bowl. Dill, if I, I'm looking at this side, it seems like I get max when I do that and then go into here with a bowl. On this one here, I mean, it looks like we can get a bowl right out of here. Is that what? Okay, we'll make That's a, what we'll, he's doing. We'll, we'll cut this in for a bowl. Okay. We'll cut. I might not know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, the thing you have to remember when you're when we get done cutting this, we need to take, this is all end grain here, right? Yeah. So we got to put sealer on it, because this is all end grain. So, uh, Definition of end grain, because that's where the two things come together. Well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> it, the, the wood is, so the feather is the structural part of the tree that holds the limb onto the tree. This wood is twice as dense is this wood over here. You saw, I showed you the chips coming out. They were just real fine dust almost. And <laughs> because this grain is going in circle, it's binding the limb to the tree. So this is much denser, it's heavier wood than this here. So. If you don't coat the feather, you get all kinds of little oh, cracks. It, it, it'll dry. start crack. This wood will crack today if we don't cut it. That's a beautiful. Okay, and then I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna cut this parallel here for the next bowl blank. And, and then I just would adjust it. I mean, I learned that from John Jordan. Rough it out between centers, and you can... My chainsawing wasn't quite right here, right? Yeah. So... Better mine. Yeah, all right. Right. So put that inside out. Don't leave that one. So here we just have a nice bowl blank. Okay, it's me. 
here, this is, we just have a, a regular bowl blank here. About 40% sapwood. Or, yeah, it'll be what it'll be. So let's, this one we're going to cut. Now this one, this is going to be the bottom of the bowl. Remember, this will be the bottom of the bowl. something there. It really would be better if I put these uh, two by fours crossways. I did that just to uh, Get an idea. Again, this is going to be the bottom of the bowl, remember. So you can see, here's your shallow points right there. So one of the things that I can, you can do in this case, is you actually could turn a deeper bowl and leave part of it natural edge. I've done that. But this will be the top, this is the top. Do you sacrifice some of the feather to put a tenon on the bottom of the bowl or use a different technique? That's a good question. Um, so when I rough out, I use, I use uh, 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 chucks, right? I, I would use a bigger chuck and I would just grab this so that the center is not turned out. You understand what I'm saying? So I'd use a, maybe number four jaws on a strong hole, which is a pretty good size, five, five and a half inch. And I'd grab it with that. Or go could, recess? What? Go no, I never do recesses, never. Because you don't you're turning out some of the feather. Here I'm not turning out any of the feather. Because your 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 bowl, in this case the bowl, is gonna be like this. So by by leaving a big tenon on here, I'm not getting rid of any of the feather. So no, I would I would use I, I never use a, uh, never use a recess. Never. Do you finish the tenon or do you just cut it off when you're done it? Well, so like on this one, yeah. it's going to be part of the finished piece. I'll flip awesome. it over when I get all done yeah. and do the bottom, right? Yeah. Um, if, if I'm doing burl like maple burl or madrone burl, I actually use glue blocks. I mean, I'd use a chuck to rough it out, yeah. but then I use a glue block when I go to finish turn it because I use face plates when I finish turn. So I'd put a glue block on here and, and use a face plate when this is dry to finish turn it. So anyway, nice. This is a nice feather. So, any other? anybody got got any other questions? And there, you could take a spindle piece out of that one yeah. there that I snipped off. That'd be a spindle piece. So why why did you leave that chunk on there? Why not just square it off? Well, I mean you can do that on the bandsaw. I mean the question is, you know, how deep do you want your bowl? If I made it all, you know, down to where that lowest point was, it would be like three inches, right? Maybe, but there's maybe a five inch bowl and you just have natural edge on one side of it. You want me to cut that, you want to no, wash that No, no, I'm just asking. Well, let's wash it down and see what we got. We don't know. That's what we my have. question. What have we got here, Dale? Well, is it a, it's not a burrow, is it? Well, maybe. So. It might be a burrow. I took that off the wood pile. I mean, it could be burl. It won't be very deep. It's all sapwood. So you can look on this end. Yeah. Here's your pith, and you got. We'd have to cut a couple inches off that end. This end's not quite so bad. Pith is clear up here. It could. It could be either a heel burl over a limb, or it could be burl. But if it's burl, it's not very deep. It's only about that deep. So. It ain't worth much. Well, it's, maybe you want to do a little bowl. <laughs> A little bowl to throw your car keys in. Yeah, it's, it's not my bowl. Okay. Would you make the top of the burl of the bottom of the bowl? I would. Normally, so Roger has a really good question. I didn't draw any burls. I just finished actually, what's Thursday, I did two what are called cat burls. And so, this is a maple tree, all right? We're dealing with a maple tree. And you, you see this maple tree, 
and it's got this burl on the outside of it, right? Yeah. People make the mistake. It's getting warm today. <laughs> yes, it is. So again, how did it grow in the tree? People think that burrow grew in the tree this way. That's not how it grew. The burrow grew in the tree from the center point out. That's how that burrow grew. This is all straight right here. And there's actually a couple of different things going on here. For maple and madrone, most of them are pin burls, right? So, the pin burl starts at the center point somewhere here, and it grows out like a snow cone. This is your typical maple burl, madrone burl, all right? Birch burl, cherry burl are different. They tend to be what's called swirl burl. That's a different burl. So, you can get two different bowls out of this, depending how you cut it out. Let's say we take a bowl out of here, all right? We're going to take this bowl. When you look at the bottom of that bowl, it's going to be the ends of all these rays. I call it a clouded pattern, or the ends of the pins. It's going to be like this. If you take your bowl out of the tree this way, you end up with a bowl with the ray pattern going across the bottom, which can be absolutely stunning in the drone. So just by turning your burl blank 90 degrees, you get two completely different bowls out of the same piece of wood. And Roger's question was, so I, the two I turned Thursday, they were cat burls. So sometimes, <coughs> sometimes you just get a small burl on the outside, right? If you take your bowl and you cut your bowl out this way, you turn all the burl out. So what I did in this case was I made this the bottom of my bowl and I came up here a ways and like this because this is all burl, right? The bottom of the bowl is all burl. Up here it's a little bit straight grain but it's up on the wall and they really don't see that. So when it's a small burl I may get the bottom of the bowl and you put that burl pattern in the bottom of the bowl because if you turn it the other way you turn all the burl out. So, I mean, yeah, so I'd make, I'd make this the bottom, and you get what you get, you know. Again, if you have the burl coming out like this, yep. and here's the fifth coming out like that, what type of grain pattern would you have if you took the burl, took it out this way? Well, you'll get the pin burl, same thing. Pin burl? Okay. But along the sides of the walls? Are yeah, these so all this is the way you'd do it if you were doing natural edge. What Doug just drew here was a natural edge bowl. And so here's your burl out here, right? And so he's taken a bowl like this and left the natural edge on it. And again, you'll have your pin. It'll be, the, it'll be this pattern here. Because uh, it's sticking out, but if it's a side no, that's would a, you have rays? Yeah, on the side here, you're going to have the rays. Rays, okay. On, on the bottom of the bowl, if you look in the bowl this way, you're going to get this pattern. Okay, but you'll have yeah. rays on the... So that's, that's your other option with natural edge, is you can take that cap burl and leave it natural edge, which if I get a nice balanced cap burl, then I do natural edge. And I should do more of them. They're very, very popular at the art shows. I just don't do very many of them. But um, if I get a nice balanced burl, I do this. If the burl's unbalanced, I do this. Any other questions?